All right, so there's a few concepts that I'm gonna briefly go over now, and then there's some, I'm gonna leave some blank spots on, on the lab for now that we'll be able to cover the material for in lecture on Wednesday. Um, so if all of the lab does not 100% make sense at this point, that's okay, because we're gonna keep going, working on it. Um, so you, we are not doing a Labster lab this week. Um, we're going to be using a, a different um, service or a uh, association called PHET or FET, um, which is uh, run by University of Colorado, which is my alma mater. So, so I'm a little uh, preferential to it. Um, but what I think does really well is it it's a, a pretty good interface um, online for visualizing in three dimensions how molecules look. Um, and so the, the link to the simulation is in, is in the PDF. If you click on the molecule shape and then, um, if you click on model, it basically gives you, it gives you this ball and stick model, like the, the same kind of, um, models you probably have seen in, in a science lab or at least, um, in, I don't know, in movies or something like that. Um, this is you, what a lot of people think of when they think of chemistry, right? Is these ball and stick models. Um, so basically it gives you one of these that you can click and drag and move it around. And you can also do things like add an extra bond, add another atom to it and see what that does to the three-dimensional shape, add a lone pair, see what that does and, or take stuff away so we can see what it looks like. So this lab um, is, based around figuring out the shapes of molecules, because it turns out the molecular shape governs a lot of the properties of these compounds. Um, and so the overall, uh, the concept um, is, and is called uh, VSEPR, um, which stands for Valence Shell Electron Pair Repulsion. Um, and actually, sorry, let me start the slideshow. Um, <clears throat> and so what, and this is pronounced, for whatever reason, it's pronounced Vesper, even though it's spelled Vesper. Vesper sounds better. Vesper sounds better. Um, and basically, it's, it's essentially just geometry where we're trying to keep these things as far away from each other as possible. All right, so the whole idea is that we, if a number of different things we have attached to a central molecule um, is, is going to determine the shape of the molecule, what we call the geometry of the molecule, right? So, and there, there are several different um, vocab terms. Um, some, some places will call them a call it a uh, electron group. Some places call it. Um, I think this lab says electron domain. And the, so the electron domain is just um, is just having electrons that take up space around an atom. Right, and so we will. We will look at um, how to figure this out without this simulation in class based on doing Lewis dot structures. Um, but there's a lot of parts of this that you can do that are just going to be based on, OK, what happens if I add another bond? What happens with no lone pairs? What does that do? Um, and that's going to change what it looks like, and that's going to change what the what the names of the geometries are. So in order to, um, to differentiate between these different shapes verbally without having to draw them or have a model every time, we give them different names for each of these shapes. Um, I just a, a good way of visualizing what it looks like to have a molecule in three dimensions because they're not always easy to draw. Drawing things in three dimensions takes artistic skill, which is something that chemists are notoriously short on. 
Um, so we'll come up with good ways to show um, three-dimensional structure, um, but they tend to be, not tend to, they're based around these five basic shapes. If you have two things attached to a central atom, then it's a geometry that we just say, it's, we just refer to it as linear. And I did not skip back far enough to show you what I actually wanted to show you. Hang on. Go back one more time. So these shapes are based on this idea that most of, the, of an atom or a molecule's shape and volume is made up of electrons. Electrons are negatively charged, which we know. We defined them that way. We also know that similar charges repel each other. They push away. So if you have a bunch of electrons around a central atom, they will try to stay as far away from each other as possible. So, and this is, this is what's called a Feynman diagram. That's just showing that if you have two electrons moving towards each other, at some point they get close enough to each other that they have this interaction that's drawn with these, this wavy line. And then that's gonna make them push off in opposite directions. So if we have two groups of electrons around a central atom, the furthest apart they can get, we don't actually rate it in terms of a distance, we rate it in terms of angles. The furthest apart you can get these two groups of electrons would be 180 degrees from each other. And so if you have two things that are 180 degrees from each other, well, that's a straight line, right? So, so trying to arrange these things in space so that they can have as much distance between each other as possible is, got, is what's going to give us these different shapes and geometries, right? If we have three things around a central atom, three groups of electrons or three electron domains, the furthest apart they can get is 120 degrees. Right? Because if you have 360 degrees to work from and you're splitting it up by having three different objects, three different lines, we can think of them as lines, the furthest apart those lines could be is 120 degrees. Um, and it's one of those things that it's, it's sort of visual and based on geometry. And if, you, if it's been a while since you've had geometry, it, that might not be totally obvious to you that that that's how you would arrange things. But think, think of trying to draw or to cut a pie into thirds. Each of those thirds, if you get it right, is going to be about 120 degrees because that's the furthest apart you can get the cuts from each other and have everything still be the same size. If we have more than three things, then the geometry start getting complicated, right? That's what this animation was showing. With four things, we don't just attach it 90 degrees, 90 degrees, because we have three dimensions to work in. So when you get past three things, it's not gonna be flat anymore, right? So here's our three or our five basic shapes. And if you can draw them, I'm not going to be picky about it if, if you um, uh, want to draw them using some conventions that I'll show you to indicate things being behind the board or in front of um, your, the piece of paper, um, sticking out of your paper or going into the paper, for instance. Um, but these first two make a lot of sense. Linear geometry is when you have only two things attached, the furthest apart they can be is 180 degrees. When you have three things attached, the furthest apart they can be is 120 degrees. When you have four things, the furthest apart they can get is not 90 degrees. The furthest apart they can get if we have three dimensions to work in is actually about 109 degrees. And it makes this shape that's called a tetrahedral geometry. Uh, and a, te a tetrahedron, in terms of a shape, a tetrahedron is just a three-sided pyramid. 
if you think of a three-sided pyramid, that's really four distinct sides to the object, right? Because the bottom of the pyramid is the, is the fourth side. And all four of those sides are the same um, size and same angles. In fact, uh, there we go. Let me see what I have here. I think I have some good. That's the one. If you want an idea of what a tetrahedron looks like, a four sided die is actually a tetrahedron. So if you think about a, this shape, this three sided pyramid, it's got three equal sides on the top. And then the one that my thumb is on is the fourth side. So a tetrahedron is a four-sided object where all four sides are the same shape. And that's what happens when you take four things, four electron groups and attach them to the same central atom, you get a tetrahedral shape. And that's because that's the way that we maximize the distance between the bonds. Um, if you keep adding more things, the, the shapes actually are easier to visualize than a tetrahedral shape. Um, for instance, you can have the term that's used as a trigonal bipyramidal shape, which looks kind of like if you put two tetrahedrons on top of each other so that it looked more like this. You've got a, an equilateral triangle around the middle. And then you have one thing sticking straight up and one thing sticking straight down. So in three dimensions, um, in terms of chemistry, we refer to that as a trigonal bipyramidal geometry. And that gives us some a little bit of weirdness with the shapes. It takes a little bit of practice to be able to visualize these. That's why we're spending time with this simulator. And a big chunk of it is click, build this shape click and drag around so you can kind of see what, what it looks like. And then the last of, of these is an, an octahedral geometry. And an octahedral geometry is kind of, if you, it's basically a square where you then take, um, take the middle of that square, you have one thing sticking straight up and one thing sticking straight down, right? So look at these, these four fluorines around the middle here. Think of that as, as a square, and then you've got a fluorine up and a fluorine down. So everything is 90 degrees from everything else, or 90 or 100 degrees from everything else. Right In 3D shape, that would look like an eight-sided die, something like that. Right, and in each of these cases, the middle atom is gonna kind of control all of this because the number of things attached to that middle atom is what gives you these different shapes. So a couple things about drawing these. Um, so I'll use the whiteboard the way you would use a um piece of paper. If you want to draw these shapes, there's usually more than one act, one way you can draw the correct shape. Um, but there are a couple of tools for showing things in three dimensions, even if you're not good at art. Um, the number, the main tool, and I'm just going to start by drawing a tetrahedral geometry, is if you draw a bond as just a flat line, that means it's in the plane of the board or in the plane of your paper. Basically, it means it's flat. So that's showing you a carbon bonded to a hydrogen where that bond is straight up and down, perpendicular to your eyes. If your eyes are looking right here, the bond is perpendicular to your eyes. If you draw a, a bond, we call it with dashes, but it's basically um, like a, it's kind of like a triangle. You can kind of see it 
Um, if you use your imagination, it's basically like you're drawing a bond. It's getting further away from you. If you draw dashes, that means that bond is going into the board. It's behind the board or behind your paper. And last but not least, if you draw a wedge or a, just a triangle, as, um, and it's frequently shaded in, but if you're doing this on your piece of paper, you don't need to shade it in. If you use your imagination again, that looks kind of like a, something that's sticking out towards you. Right? It's like a bond that's a flat line, except it's coming out of the board towards you. So if I want to draw a tetrahedral shape, and I'm no good at art and shading, and I don't want to mess with that anyway, this is your shorthand for doing it. A line means it's flat. A wedge means it's pointed towards you. And the dots mean it's going away from you into the board or behind your paper. And so if we use those tools, we can actually draw all five of those basic shapes pretty easily. Sorry, Sean, can you say that yeah. again with the wedge is going toward you? No. So away from if, you, if you squint your eyes and tilt your head funny, you can use your imagination. You can, it kind of looks like this is a, what was a, you know, a toothpick, but it's now the toothpick is pointed out like, like yeah. that. And so the wedge is pointing out towards you. The dot, the dashes is going away from you. And so it's kind of looks like it's getting smaller. Right. And so there are various ways of doing this and doing this on a computer to be able to make these look perfect, but you're not always going to have a computer and I'm not going to teach you how to use um, these systems until you need to for now. Um, it's probably going to be more useful for you to just know how to draw it by hand. And since we're already pretty good at submitting things, taking pictures, su submitting things as PDFs. Um, right. And so this gives us a lot of flexibility too to be able to visualize what this looks like in three dimensions. I don't have my molecule kits out right now. And actually, I might have taken them back to my LTCC anyway. I'll have to find those. Um, but this, this is the, the way to draw a tetrahedral shape. The easiest way to draw it is generally you're going to take two bonds, and they're going to be flat. And then you're going to have your other two bonds are kind of pointed generally in the same direction, about a third of the way around the circle. But there's two bonds, one of which is going away from you and one is coming towards you. All right, so if I switch back to the screen share just for a second. No, that one. So that's this shape. If you can think about visualizing this from from above, you kind of have, let's see if I can get these two bonds to be flat and get it to be facing exactly the way I want it to. Yeah, it's close. You've got one bond that's flat in the plane of the board, a second bond that's flat in the plane of the board, one atom coming out towards you, one atom that's going away from you gives you this overall tetrahedral structure. All right, there are other ways to draw it. If I click and drag this around, you can, you can kind of, you can start to see, okay, well, I can draw it where I've got one bond coming straight to us and the rest of them are all totally flat, or you can draw it so that, uh, where's the other one that's really common? It's, it's sort of like halfway in between the two. I can't get it to rotate the right way right now. Um, the easiest way in general though, is to draw it so that you got bond flat, bond flat, one going away, one coming towards you. All right, this is, 
again, this is the trickiest geometry to draw because these other ones that have more electron groups are actually the same shapes as we had before. It's basically a linear, like this trigonal bipyramidal looks complicated, but it's really trigonal planar. It's really a flat triangle plus a linear geometry. You've got a linear geometry going straight up and down, and then you have trig this planar geometry that's flat in the middle. Are we only if using I, those, sorry to interrupt, but are we only using those uh, ways of drawing the electrons or the shapes in the tetrahedral? We'll use them. So I'm going to go and I'll show you how to do it for trigonal pyramidal as well. But I just want you to get a better idea of what that shape looks like. If I look straight above from the trigonal bipyramidal, so that's this molecule, except I'm looking looking at this top chlorine straight down this line. If you do that, what it looks like is that it's just a flat triangle molecule, right? It doesn't really look like it's that complicated. And if I do the other way, if I look at it totally flat, these just look linear, right? The ones that stick up and above and below the triangle are just a straight line. So you've got a trigonal geometry, triangular geometry in the middle, plus an extra two lines sticking straight up and down. So the way that we draw this, and I'm just going to use, um, let's see, we do phosphorus penta, pentafluoride. Um, if you start by drawing the ones that are straight up and down, it doesn't matter what the atoms are. I'm just trying to stick with that with compounds that I know exist, but you don't have the same knowledge that I do. So uh, don't worry about that as much. Then the other three things that are attached to the phosphorus are a triangle around the middle. So the way we draw that is you draw one part of your triangle sticking straight to the side, one that's coming out towards you. So where's the last one going to go? In to the board, away from you. And you can kind of see hopefully, or at least with, with practice, you've got a triangle shape between these fluorines that's flat. And then you have a straight line going up and down. So it's really just putting together two of the, um, two of the shapes that we've already dealt with. You've got a trigonal planar plus a linear. All right. And again, it just it takes practice to know and to know what the, the best way is of drawing these. Go ahead. What shape was that? So this oh so the name of this one is trigonal bipyramidal because it looks like two pyramids stacked on top of each other. All right, so the last three-dimensional shape. So our first one was linear. That's easy to draw every because it's flat. It's a straight line. Trigonal planar. Trigonal is another way of saying triangular. Trigonal planar is also flat, just a triangle shape. Tetrahedral was a little bit tricky. Trigonal bipyramidals, when we just did, the last one is octahedral. An octahedral is basically you can think of it like three linear shapes on top of each other you basically are going to make a square and then have one thing sticking up 90 degrees above the square and one thing sticking 90 degrees below the square 
All right, so the drawing the square we kind of just draw it like but drawing the um the triangle side from from the last one we want a flat square in the middle we draw something that looks like that and hopefully you can see that that's vaguely square shaped. We think about this, it's, it's a lot like drawing, if you've drawn 3D axes in a math class, you have had to plot, plot things in 3D or show X, Y, and Z on a graph. It's a lot like drawing the axes on a, three, on a 3D graph, X, Y, and Z. Here's your X, here's your Y, and then Z sticks straight up and down, right? And the whole idea with this geometry, this one's actually the easiest, one of the easiest to wrap your heads around in terms of what it looks like. Every one of these bonds is 90 degrees from the other ones that are around it. And so it's, it's not a square because a square has six sides. Or sorry, it's not a cube, I mean. This cube has six sides. This has eight sides because it's a square plus these sticking up and down. All right, so this is mostly to put you at ease because people in chemistry classes get, get worried when I start think, saying things like, you're gonna have to draw this molecule and then they see what it looks like in 3D and then it get, everybody panics. It's easy enough to draw these shapes once you know how to use these wedges and dashes. And each one of those five basic um, shapes has a standard way of drawing. All right, this might be kind of a stupid question, but if that's an octahedral, why does it only have six, six dimensions or? six ways it, it goes yes yeah, so you're exactly right it has it has six directions but if we actually color in if we connected um each of these fluorines the ones next to it we actually wind up with eight um eight triangles put together so instead of a cube that is that is six squares put together Mm -hmm. An octahedron is eight triangles put together. All right, so the the actual shape winds up looking like something that. like this. You see, you've got the square around the middle, one uh -huh. thing sticking up and one thing sticking down. So it's two four sided pyramids. Oh, where the bases are stuck together. Hard for me to conceptualize with a flat thing like that. It is, it is. And that's why drawing it in 3D winds up taking a lot of practice and, and actually why um, one of the hardest things about, about organic chemistry is visualizing some of these molecules in three dimensions. It takes a lot of practice. All right, the good news is that in terms of standard situations, you're almost never going to get anything beyond this octahedral shape. There are some other funny shapes that exist out there. One that looks more like it's like a pentagon in the middle with one thing sticking up and one thing sticking down. Um, but that's about as complicated as it, as it gets because you still have to be able to physically get things close to this middle atom. And there's only so much space around this atom. So if we can get the hang of visualizing these shapes, um, then that's about as complicated as it gets. All right, so a couple last notes about this lab. The, the last wrinkle I said there are five basic shapes. Um, we're essentially, there's, there's more possible ways 
to have these molecules basically because we can't always see what's taking up space. In some of these molecules, we can only see, we can't see any of these directly. The way we can measure where these different atoms are is basically by bouncing electrons off of it or bouncing light off of it. And it tends, and when it hits a nucleus, it bounces off in a funny direction. So we can measure where the nuclei are, but if something doesn't have a nucleus, if it's just an electron, for instance, then it's still going to push away the other electrons, but we can't see it because there's nothing there to bounce light off of. There's no nucleus. And so they still make these same five shapes. It's just sometimes we can't see one of the atoms. And so we actually have different names for that situation, depending on it. And so before you panic, this left-hand column are those five basic shapes we've just been talking about. The number of things taking up space around the middle atom are going to tell you whether it's linear, trigonal planar, tetrahedral, trigonal bipyramid, or octahedral. The rest of these are just what happens when we can't see one or more of those atoms. The electrons will still take up space, but we can't tell that the nucleus is there. We can just see the effects of it because they push on the other atoms. So for instance, if you have a trigonal planar shape, if you have three electron groups around a middle atom, but you can't see one of them, the result is a molecular geometry that we call bent. Because it looks like these two, where's my laser pointer? It looks like these two bonds are closer than they would normally want to be. They're 120 degrees. So there must be something else there taking up space, or else they would be 180 degrees. Right? So all of these other versions are just modifications on the five basic geometries we already went over. If you have a tetrahedral shape, with one in one of those electron groups is what's called a lone pair, meaning it's not between two atoms, then you can only see these three X's and the middle atom. And so the name, we actually have a different name for that shape just so we can describe it verbally, but it's still really a tetrahedral shape with one lone pair. And if it's a tetrahedral, go ahead. What do the dots mean there? So the, the dots are a pair of electrons. Oh. So we'll, we'll go over drawing Lewis dot structures on Wednesday. Um, mm -hmm. And basically that, that pair of electrons, that's still taking up space, but we can't see it. So we give the geometry a different name. That's the only difference. And this it's slide is available to look at in the... Yeah. This is in the in the lecture slides, and we'll go over it again, and uh, and practice with it in lecture as well. Okay. Um, but this is a really good cheat sheet because it has all the names and how to draw them on this. It's not a fancy one; they don't look as good as that previous slide, but it has all the same information and more. Right. And so again, I'm not going to be picky on a test about whether or not you remember the name because some of these names are really weird as long as you can draw it. So for some of you that can visualize things in 3D a little bit more or see how these shapes sort of work together, as long as you can draw it, I don't care if you remember that, that it's called T-shaped, as long as you draw it properly. All right, and again, you can see as you go from left to right on any of these rows, where you're drawing the wedges and the dashes is not changing. It's just a matter of, is there something you can see at the end of that or not? Because the lone pairs, we just can't see them. We can just tell that they're there because they take up space. So, and what that would look like, I just stopped screen share, but I didn't want to do that. On the, um, on the simulation is if I wanted to have five groups of electrons taking up space, one of them is a lone pair. You can start here and you can add, okay, I'm going to turn, I'm going to add 
four things that are attached and then one lone pair to it. The overall shape of this is still going to be trigonal bipyramidal. The electron geometry, that same basic shape, is still trigonal bipyramidal. You saw five things taking up space, so they're going to make that triangle in the middle with one thing sticking up and one thing sticking down. But if you can't see the lone pair, it looks like this which all of a sudden looks a little bit different. It doesn't quite look tetrahedral and it doesn't look planar. And so showing the lone pair makes it easy to see, oh, I've got five things taking up space. Therefore, the electron geometry is this trigonal bipyramidal, that triangle with one thing up and down. But if you can't see that, that's why we have different names for these. Instead of just saying trigonal bipyramidal with one lone pair, they call this a, a seesaw or a, a sawhorse. Um, because if you rotate it around just right, it kind of looks like a teeter totter, right? You think of, of this straight piece in the middle as being the part that the kids sit on, and this is your, your fulcrum in the middle. All right, so they call it a seesaw geometry but it's really just a variation of that trigonal bipyramidal. Right? And there's definitely a couple of key vocab words that if you know them, it'll, it'll make memorizing the names much easier. Trigonal means triangular, right? Pyramidal means pyramid. Planar means flat. Um, if you have that in mind, a lot of these other names make sense. A square pyramid versus a square planar. Right? You can kind of visualize what those are once you get some of this vocab down. Um, let me make sure that that's all you need for the lab. Where do we go? Um, so... And this, this will also show you the bond angles as well. So you can see what you're looking at and you can label it on, on your drawings as well. Um, no, the tab, that's the one. Um, I don't think until you get to number 16, you don't need to be able to draw Lewis dot structures. Right, because that's what we're going to spend a fair bit of time on Lewis dot structures on Wednesday. So that will make a lot more sense once we get there. For now, it's just about knowing electrons push away other electrons. How can I draw that and the shapes that come from that? Right. And so this tool is helpful for that because you can make it look like whatever you need it to and then draw what comes out of it. And this table is really helpful too. All right, so again, I'm letting you, to, to, I'm, I don't think I'm dumping you in the deep end too much, but you will probably have other questions or need to think about some of these concepts to answer some of the questions. But I think you have the tools to do it, but if I've forgotten anything, just don't hesitate to let me know. And with that, I'll, turn you loose on the assignment and you can start working on it. What was that called again? That last, the, the model building? Oh, v Vesper, V-S-E-P-R. Oh, you're right. Yes. Awesome. Uh, the table is printable, but it's not pulled out separately. Let me, let me, I think I have it. And one of mine, let me see if I have a good figure already pulled out. Otherwise, I'll upload one to this week's. So here's another way of visualizing that same table that has the drawings on there as well. Um, this one looks a little bit better, but it might not be quite as easy to see what's happening, but it has all the, all the information. Uh, I don't think I have that other the simpler table pulled out yet. So I'll put that, I'll put that as a download on the um on week 
week six overview page okay. on uh, Canvas. All right, anything else before you dive in? Nope. Then have I, at it. I have, an, oh, I have a non, I have a non-content related question. Um, okay, I'll stop, stop recording.